we are going into a brand new series uh, this week, and we're going to be doing it three in a row, and then I'm going to be off on vacation. And when I come back, I'm going to do two more in this series. Uh, during the time that I'm away, uh, Andrea is going to be preaching for me one of those Sundays, and my son Josh is also going to be preaching for us uh, one of those Sundays. And of course, one of those Sundays is a long weekend, and so we're going to be at um, uh, we're going to be at Hope Fellowship that weekend uh, in Curtis. So pay attention to your e bulletin and when all those things are. But this series is called How Did the Bible Come Together or Ta Biblia. And the reason why I use the word, the Greek words Ta Biblia on the top is because it just really looked really cool. It basically means the Bible, okay? So it's the Greek words for the Bible. And how did we get, how did the Bible come together? Well, that's the whole focus of this next series. And what I'd like to do today is to talk about the beginning place from how we got the Bible to begin with. And if you've got this sheet with you, you can kind of follow along. On this side is a timeline of Luke's writing of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And on this side, we have a little bit of a summary of the Gospels and about Luke himself. So you can follow along as we we go through this today. But if you've ever taken a high school philosophy class, or you've gone to college or university and you've taken a philosophy class, or you've just been, you know, dropping down the hole of YouTube and you came across some guy who was trying to dismantle the Bible somehow, some way on YouTube, you've probably come across the idea that if they can pick away at the Bible, if they can uh, pull a card out from this house of cards, it'll all come tumbling down. And so they attack Genesis because of the six-day creation uh, what they call myth, or they attack, attack the book of Revelation because that's just far too outrageous of a book to have any real meaning for the church. Or they attack certain stories in the Bible, and they figure that by doing that, the whole story of your Christian faith, your whole faith life, will tumble like a house of cards. How many of you experience that in your either educational life or by someone who has just decided to take it out on you because you're a Christian. Yeah? Quite a few of you have had that experience. <clears throat> what we're going to do in this series is we're going to take, we're going to begin with the event that created the movement that we now know as the church. And out of that movement came the Bible. Hear me again. We're going to start with the event, the event that started it all that created the movement that eventually led to what we now know as the Bible. So I'm going to start with a question, and you can answer it if you want to. So um, if I'm going to ask you a question, you can answer, all right? So here's the first question. Uh, what would happen to you? Now, you here, right here, today, what would happen to you if your birth certificate, along with every record of your birth, vanished from the earth? <laughs> You'd be lost. But you're right here. Janet would know that you're here. You wouldn't know the government anybody. Isn't that cool? Some of you are going to rip up your birth certificate when you get home. <laughs> the, the, the real answer to this question is nothing would change for you. Really, I mean, you're still you. I mean, you'd have some government problems, some paperwork problems. Certainly, you know, you wouldn't get your child tax credit if it all disappeared. But really, you are still you. So here's another question. Uh, let's say they found your birth certificate, and in your birth certificate, there was an error. What would happen to you? Nothing. You might want to go and make the correction. You might want to make sure that it all lines up. But nothing happens to you. It's not like you just disappeared in front of me, right? So which comes first? You came first, right? You were born. Your parents had you. And eventually, the government caught up and got all the paperwork in order. Well, the same thing is true of what we have in the Bible, an event is what happens. Nobody showed up at your house when you were born and said, can I see the paperwork, please? Nobody shows up at your house when you have a child and says, can you prove to me that this child exists by, per by presenting me with their birth certificate? No, no, they just look at the child. <laughs> An event has happened. Something significant happened in your life or in the life of your parents, 
And that event led to the documentation of that event, which led to other things that follow as a result of that. The same thing is true when it comes to the Bible. An event happened, and because of that event, a movement started. And out of that movement came what we now know as the Bible. So we have to remember this, that when Jesus was on the earth, this didn't exist. The whole time that Jesus was alive, there was no Bible. And I think that we are under the impression that this book actually is the reason why we have Christianity, that this is the reason Christianity exists. That's not true. The reason Christianity exists is because an event that happened, and because of that event, a movement started, and because of that movement, they started to record the events that had taken place, much like the fact when you were born, it was an event. Nobody asked you for your birth certificate to prove that you were born. You're right there. (laughs) Now, later on, after the book was written, there uh, can be some criticism that goes with that. But how the Bible got together to begin with started with an event. Now, surprisingly, the story of the Bible doesn't actually start in the beginning, right? You know, we get the first chapter in the Bible, and it says, in the beginning, God created in the heavens of the earth. That's actually not the beginning of the story. The beginning of the story is literally two-thirds of the way through the book. And they organize the pages, the things in the Bible, in order to bring a chronology into place rather than starting with the event that started it all. What is the event? Well, it's the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, and especially the resurrection. It's because of the resurrection of Jesus that you and I are followers of Jesus. Without the resurrection, this doesn't mean a hill of beans. Because Jesus is a historical person. Because of the fact that Jesus is a historical person doesn't make you a Christian. There are extra biblical sources, writers who weren't Jewish, people who were outside of the Christian faith, who have written and documented that Jesus was a real person, and he really went before Pilate, and he really died on the cross. No one in history, no one who is educated in history, disputes the fact that Jesus lived and died. The thing that makes us Christians, the thing that makes you and I followers of Jesus, is the resurrection. That one man could die on a cross and rise again. The story of the Bible begins in the third part, half, the third piece of the Bible itself. It begins with the Gospels. And in order to begin that conversation, I want to talk about this man named Luke. Luke is a doctor. Luke is an educated man. Luke is Greek. He's not Jewish. And he wrote this gospel at a probably this, well, and he didn't know it was a gospel. See, that's the thing. We tell everybody that it's a gospel. But when Luke wrote it, it was just a record of the events that happened. Mark wasn't the gospel of Mark. John wasn't the gospel of John. Uh, you know, Matthew wasn't the... And then it was just documents recording this incredible event and the life of Jesus. And so here is this physician who is uh, taking the time to think through and to document what happened. And uh, so we get this uh, little snippet of who he is at the beginning of the book of Luke. And so we're going to start with Luke chapter 1 and begin reading uh, from this passage. Luke is basically giving us an introduction to why he wrote. And he says this, Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Just think about that for a second. Many people. Many people. Why would people do that? Why would people write the stories the accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among them. Well, because this was such a significant event. 
So many people had given testimony to what happened during those times that some people, some of them who were educated, some of them who were able to write, were decided, we've got to put this down on paper. Right? Could you imagine the, maybe the Roman centurion who had Jesus pray for his son from miles and miles away who was completely healed, probably wrote down somewhere an account of what happened to him. What about Lazarus who was risen from the dead? Is it possible that Lazarus could have written down somewhere what happened to him? Why? Because these events were so powerful. And like the other writings of the time, they were fragile and they didn't last. And so now Luke, writing at about 70 AD, Jesus, if you look at your sheet on the timeline here, uh, uh, Good Friday is 33 AD. Easter Sunday, Jesus walks out of the tomb alive. And then after that, many people start uh, coming out of the hiding and telling stories about how they saw Jesus. 500 or more people said they saw Jesus between the time that he rose from the grave and the time that he went back up to heaven. And so then Luke starts to document what happens at around 70 AD. And he says this about what he's going to do. Now, verse 2, they used, they used, the people who wrote these other accounts, they used eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Now, it's likely here that Luke is referring to Mark, who'd probably already written some of his gospel. He's probably referring to some of those people who had individual stories or accounts of Jesus, and someone decided to write them down. But Luke relies heavily on eyewitness accounts himself. And so then verse 3, he says, Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus. Well, who's this guy Theophilus? I have decided to carefully investigate everything. And because I've done that, I'm going to write an account for you, most excellent Theophilus. When you use a title like that, most excellent, most honorable, uh, you are uh, giving homage to the fact that this person is probably wealthy. He's probably a patron of Luke somehow. Obviously, Luke didn't get a salary from the government because that didn't exist at the time. He required on wealthy individuals to help him in the work as a physician. And Theophilus was obviously a Greek because that's a Greek name. And so he's writing to this friend of his, this patron of his. And he says, I'm going to write down because you've been asking questions, because you've been asking me about what happened. And because I was there for part of this journey, I'm going to write down what happened. And so you can be certain of the truth of everything that you were taught. Luke had no idea at this point how important the Gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts would be. He had no idea that we would hold his record of what happened in our hands. He was trying to help the message of the gospel spread. You see, because after Jesus rose from the dead, between 33 and 70, the church began to grow. This movement happened, and people converted en masse 3,000 one day, 3,000 another day. People began to spread out into the, the, into the Mediterranean and share the message of the gospel. And in order for them to get an accurate account of what happened in the life of Jesus, several of his followers decide to write down in a series of books to give an account, to give an orderly account of what happened. Now in uh, the book of Acts, so uh, I learned this, I thought this was kind of neat. When you were writing a scroll in the time of Luke, the maximum length of a scroll was 27 feet. Don't ask me why. Uh, but basically, it was anything longer than 27 feet, you couldn't roll it up anymore. <laughs> it was too heavy to carry. And so Luke writes the Jesus account, and then he writes the book of Acts. So Luke is the author of both of these books. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. So he writes Acts and he writes Luke. He also gives an introduction here, and he begins to tell the story once again as to why he's writing. So in Acts chapter 1, 
verses 1, it says, In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up into heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. So Luke is this educated man. Remember, he's uh, sharing what he's uh, witnessed, and he's going to the individuals. He probably talked to Mary. He probably had a chance to chat with uh, some of the, the women that follow Jesus from place to place. He certainly had a chance to talk with the disciples. We know for sure that he uh, talked to Peter, and we know for sure that he talked to Paul, and he was probably talking to Mark. Why? Because Mark is a cousin of Barnabas. Some of you don't know who that name is, but in the New Testament, this man named Barnabas shows up, and he goes on the missions with Paul to plant all these churches, and Mark's his nephew, and he teaches his nephew. But Luke went along on that journey. In the book of Acts... Several times throughout the book, it says, we went from this place to that place. Luke is writing. And then other times he said, they went from this place to that place. So we know that Luke knew all of these people. And so he had conversations with them. And he documents points that each person was able to share. He interviewed them, got their first person accounts. So when you think about the authenticity of this book, when you think about whether or not you can trust this book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts were all written within 30 years of Jesus' death, 40 years of Jesus' death. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they were written on the request of firsthand accounts of the people that were there. So not only do these writers write what they saw and what they heard, but they went and talked to the people that were there. How reliable is that story? Okay, now it starts to make a little bit more sense. Maybe it starts to make a little bit more uh, sense to you because you've been wondering about this yourself. You've been wondering, how reliable is the words in the Bible to me? Can they be true? Verse 2, or verse 3 of, of Acts chapter 1. Thank you, Wayne. Verse 3, during the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. See, this is... The most important statement, I think, in the book of Luke's. He proved to them in many ways. If my faith hinges on whether or not I believe that Jesus rose from the dead or not, I want to know what those proofs are. I want to know what he did in order to make them believe that he was alive. Well, the Bible tells us that he walked with some of the disciples and explained the Old Testament scriptures to them. So there was an intellectual conversation with a real person. They walked along the road the whole day long, and then they had a meal together. He showed up with Peter on the, on the side of the Sea of Galilee and sat with him and ate fish with him and drew in the sand. He showed up at many different occasions where the disciples were gathered, and he spoke to them. Thomas, the doubting disciple, said, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. And when Jesus showed up, Jesus said to him, come, put your hand here where the nail went in. Put your fist here so you can see the place where I put the, put the spear. These were the convincing proofs that happened, not just to one person. He didn't just show himself to the 12 disciples, but he showed himself to many people. The Bible tells us that over 500 people saw him between the time that he died and rose again. And the thing that happened for the disciples was they were expecting that he was going to die. They walked away from the crucifixion and they went home. The Bible tells us that, that they left Jerusalem and went back home. Peter went, went off to Capernaum, several days journey 
Joseph of Arimathea, a man of the Jewish ruling council in Jerusalem, was a friend of Nicodemus. Some of you know who Nicodemus is. Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, if you want to know spiritual things, you have to be born again. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus show up at Pilate's door after Jesus dies, and they take his body down. How much more real could the death of Jesus be than for those two men and their servants and the women who anointed his body for burial? How much more real could it be that Jesus actually died than to bury someone in a tomb? And roll the door closed and walk away. And yet, three days later, those women were the first ones to see him alive again. My faith is hinged upon the fact that Jesus actually did this. And if I believe that that is true, if I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again and that he ascended into heaven, if I believe that, then I believe it as a fact not as a fictionary thing that I think about. And if I believe it as a fact, then that proves the deity of Jesus, that he is God and he was a man. Because nobody can rise from the dead except God. So listen to this logic. If it is fact, then Jesus is God. And if Jesus is God, then he must speak the truth. That everything that he said was true. And if everything that he said was true, then I can trust everything that he taught. That's how the logic of our faith has to follow if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now, the book of Acts is Luke's second part of the story. The 27-foot scroll is too long. He can't uh, put any more on it, and so he writes another scroll for the, the, the Acts of the Apostles. And he writes it again to Theophilus. But the book of Acts is also a theological book. He's not just a historian, of which he was extraordinary, by the way. Uh, Scholars today look at how Luke wrote, and he wasn't intending necessarily to be historical in his approach, but because of the way he wrote, because of being a doctor, he was very particular about making sure that the names of people in charge were the right names, the countries that they went were the right countries, that he would uh, know the directions of which way they were traveling so that it was consistent with where those towns and cities were. Uh, He was very specific about things. But it's also a theological book. It's a book about the Holy Spirit, about how God's Spirit is poured out upon a group of people, and that group of people start a movement because they saw Jesus too. And they began inviting people into that story over and over and over again. So why do we have three, uh, four gospels? Why do we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Wouldn't one just be enough? I mean, that's what some of the arguments are against the Bible. Why is there four accounts? And why do these four accounts not Why aren't they consistent with one another? Why aren't they exactly the same? Are there contradictions in one of them? And so we have to answer that question, right? When I was training to become a police officer years ago, uh, one of the things they taught us about eyewitness testimony is that if you get four people in a room and they all tell exactly the same story, they're all lying. Why? Why? Because they've rehearsed their story, (laughs) right? When you get four people in the room and they tell you the exact same thing, they're lying. And so the implication is is that each of these books need to be told truthfully, but from each person's perspective, right? So when we came in here this morning, one of the things that I'm going to remember most about coming in here this morning is the fact that Leanna walked in with a motorcycle helmet, Some of you didn't even see Eliana come in the door. But I remember it. It was like, boy, she's so cool, and that just makes her cooler. <laughs> You're all red, sorry. <laughs> Is it true? Absolutely. Did some of you see it? Yes, some of you saw it. Yeah. 
and you can tell the story from your perspective. That's how the gospels work. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They each tell the story from their perspective, from how they interacted with it. Just think about the gospel of Matthew for a moment. Matthew is Levi in the story of the gospels. Jesus comes up to Levi on the side of the road where he's collecting taxes, and all he says to him is, come follow me. And, and Matthew, or Levi, just leaves everything. He's a rich man. He collects taxes. He made a really good living at collecting taxes. And so then he writes his gospel as a Jew who had fallen away from Judaism very far. He writes to a Jewish audience. And we know from the early church fathers that the original book of Matthew was written in Hebrew. We don't have that copy anymore. We have a Greek translation. And so Matthew's writing to the people of his heart, his family, his church, and he's including all kinds of references from the Old Testament so that they could see the relationship between the two texts and how Jesus fulfilled the promises of the Old Testament into the New Testament story. Matthew is just passionate about seeing the Jewish believers come to know Jesus. Mark, I already told you a little bit about Mark already. Mark, or, or as we know him from the book of Acts. John Mark is his name. He's a cousin of Barnabas. He spent time with Paul and Peter and James, and he spent time with Luke and Barnabas. And 30 years after Jesus died, he decides to write an account, and he goes to see Peter from the second century. We know from the church fathers that they had conversations with Peter and Mark who told them that they had gotten together about 20 years after Jesus died, And Mark interviews Peter. Who's Peter? Peter's one of Jesus' disciples. Peter's a fisherman. Peter probably doesn't have a very intellectual mind. He's a very practical man. All his life, he's been a fisherman. And so the story that we get from Mark is all the actions of Jesus. It would make sense then, wouldn't it? The reason why Mark's gospel is so short is because Peter said, you don't need to have that in there. You don't need this. You need this in there. And this is what Jesus did. And so Mark records, half of the book of Mark is just the last week of Jesus' life. And then you have Luke, who we already talked about, and then John. Now, John is Jesus' best friend. Every time you hear about him going off by himself or taking a few disciples, John is with him. When John writes the Gospel of John, he says several times in there, he said, and the one Jesus loved was there. That's how he refers to himself in the presence of Jesus when he's writing. He said, and the one that Jesus loved, basically saying, and I love this man. John's his best friend. But 40 years after Jesus died, he gets exiled for his preaching and for his testimony to an island called Patmos. And now he has years to sit and to think and to write And during that time, he writes the Gospel of John, he writes the letters of John, and he writes the book of Revelation. And he's very philosophical in his thinking. And so we have the opening to the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. (laughs) It's different than how Luke starts his Gospel, Dear Theophilus, right? John writes from this philosophical point of view. As a matter of fact... Just think about this for a moment. As a matter of fact, if all that you had, if you took this part and you just tore it in half and you dropped this part, I'm not saying that this is not inspired scripture, okay? I'm not. But if all you took was the gospel of John and you tore it out of your Bible, let me ask you this question. How would you answer? If you had, that was the only thing that you had to read, could you be a Christian? Yeah. Do you have to have an opinion on the seven days of Genesis to be a Christian? No. Do you have to believe in all of the Old Testament and all of the letters of Paul in order to become a Christian? No. Why? Because in John chapter 3, John looks at Nicodemus and said, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, that if you believe in him, Nicodemus, and you receive it, you will have eternal life. 
we just recently started this Bible study that you've heard about uh, with Carl and Shondell, and Rose is here. She's part of it. Kathy's here. She's part of the Bible study. Uh, and we started reading the book of John. Why? Because the book of John gives everything we need to know and to be a follower of Jesus. Is it enough? Yes. Is it everything that I should know about being a Christian? No. But it's enough. You see, the Bible started with an event. An event that's recorded in this book. This book did not make people Christians in the first century because it didn't exist. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until 370 AD until the final copy of the canon was produced. So for the first, second, and most of the third century, there was no Bible. There was just these accounts, these written documents that moved from place to place to place that told the story of who Jesus was. As we move through this series, we're going to be talking about the role that the Old Testament plays in the life of the church and how, what role it should play when we think about this book. We're going to talk about the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we're going to talk about why God used that metaphor. We're also going to be looking through the, the work of Paul in the gospel later in the, se- the second part of the Bible in the New Testament and asking the question, how does Paul understand the Bible and how it should be interpreted? How did we get all these things together? And the last part we're going to talk about is how do we know that this book is reliable? As you think about your faith, the last part of the book of John says this, from John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. The purpose of the book, it's the subheading in uh, my Bible, it says the purpose of the book of John. The purpose is that the disciples saw Jesus do many other miracles, miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded into this book. You spend three years with somebody, that's a lot of content, right? You imagine blogging on that every day? I just did a little bit of math in my head, and if I blogged 500 words a day for three years, that would be 15,000 words, okay, for three years. I don't know if that's true. What's the math in that? I thought I did the whole math of that. Yeah. I th- you, know what I, you know what I did? I did, I did 500. Clear. I did 500 times 30 days. That's what I did in my head. 500 times. So if I wrote a blog every day for a month, that's 15,000 words. Did you know that the Gospel of Mark is 14,000? <laughs> The Gospel of Luke is 27,000 words. Can you imagine if we blogged every day of the life of Jesus in those three and a half years of those disciples? Of course there would be more things that were not written about. There's so many more things. But why? Why then write this account? Verse 31. But these are written so that you may continue to believe. Who's the you he's talking about? This is, this is John writing in, in, at around between 70 and 90 AD. That you, who's the you? That's you. <laughs> and the you is me. These things were written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah to the Jews and he is the Son of God to the Greeks and that by believing him, you will, in him you will have life by the power of his name. That's the next line that you will have life by the power of his name. You see, without the resurrection, there's no faith. Without the resurrection, there's no forgiveness. Without the resurrection, there's no gift of the Holy Spirit, there's no church, and there's no Bible. There wouldn't be any point in writing this if it wasn't for the resurrection of Jesus. And for some of you who are struggling with your own faith, and you're wondering, do I have to believe everything that's in the Bible? No. This is the the closest thing 
that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Why? Because over 500 people saw him. And people who saw him and knew him and interviewed people who saw him wrote this stuff down so that you and I might have an accurate account of what happened. And that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Believing in Jesus makes you a Christian. You know, there are many world religions out there that have no connection to their founder, right? Uh, Buddha, you don't have to believe that Buddha really existed in order to be a Buddhist. But in Christianity, you got to believe Jesus exists. And you got to believe that he died and he rose again. Because without it, there is no Christianity. And after that, the believers came out of hiding and they started telling the story. Telling the story. Our faith is founded on real events. And that's why the Bible is so precious. Amen. Lord, we want to thank you for the book, Ta Biblia, the Bible. We want to thank you for the men and women who heard the stories and told them again and again. And for those who took up the challenge to write down what they saw. Thank you, Jesus, that you were real, that you're not a figment of my imagination, that it's not just a psychological wish that you're real. Thank you, Lord, that we can believe in this and that you are God and I am your son. Lord, for those of us who are struggling with the Bible and all that it says, I pray, Lord, that we begin to sift through and to point to the thing here, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your son, power of God to overcome sin, forgiveness that's possible as the foundation of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.